the court. Uh, you get that status by hanging around for a long period of time. I've been a member of the court for 15 years. Um, I have connections with this program that run back a, more than a couple decades. Uh, I had the privilege of bringing, a, as an assistant coach, a team to the national competition. We were stunned to get there, but uh, enjoyed the experience. Uh, and then thereafter, I've had the opportunity to serve as a judge at the national finals uh, on several occasions. And I'm delighted to be with you here today. As I've told the other groups, our court uh, is also experimenting with um, uh, remote uh, arguments as we are going to have today. Um, and we'll ha we have some of the same issues that I'm sure we'll have here. There'll be a glitch here and there, and there'll be a dropped word or two. And my advice to you is worry not about it at all. Uh, we're going to master all of those problems and we're gonna have a great conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, good afternoon. Is it, I think it's afternoon where you are too as well. Uh, my name is Tandy McConnell. I was a professor of history at Columbia College in South Carolina for about 20 years. Then a few years ago, I decided to do something different. So I've been teaching eighth graders uh, for the last three years, which is very, very, very different from teaching college students. Uh, but doing a lot of reading and writing on that as well. And I am delighted and honored to be here with you today. And I look forward to hearing our conversation and being part of the conversation with you. Nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Tina Gabrielson. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Wyoming here in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, I teach political philosophy. So courses like American political thought and intro to political philosophy. Um, and I've taught or rather been a judge at the state level a couple times. This is the first time that I've been a national judge and it's um, proving to be great fun. So I'm looking forward to our time together today. I'll go ahead and begin with the question for you. Actually, no. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> first, I will, first, I will ask you all to introduce yourselves and your teacher and then we'll go, go forward. Good afternoon. We are Unit 1 from Grant High School in Portland, Oregon. I'm Carolyn Lee. I'm Quinn Peters. I'm Kayla Roberts. I'm Henry Windish. I'm Izzy McPherson, and our teacher is Misty Pasquale. Great. Thank you. So the question that we have for you uh, is Unit 1, right? What are the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system? Uh, and the question is number three. Aristotle asserts in politics that it is not the form of government, rule by the one, the few, or the many that matters most, but rather the ends of government that are most important. Where in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution did the framers set forth the ends of government? How did the framers differ, if at all, about how the ends of government should be prioritized? Which of the ends of government set forth in the Declaration and Constitution appear to have the highest priority today? You can begin when you're ready. Many different ideas surround the term ends of government. In his second treatise of government, John Locke states that the biggest reason for men's uniting into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. Thomas Hobbes, however, believed the main purpose of government is simply to protect its citizens and that political obligation ends when protection ceases. The Declaration of Independence sets out the ends of government that were ignored by King George III. The grievances detailed in the Declaration reveal the King neglected to protect property through blocking ports and raising taxes without consent. He also failed to protect the colonists by quartering troops in their homes and exciting domestic insurrections amongst the colonists. The preamble of the Constitution sets forth the most important ends of government justice, domestic tranquility, the common defense, the general welfare, and liberty. Article 3, Section 1 provides that the judicial power is vested in the Supreme Court and lower courts to allow justice for wrongs. Article 4 was one of the ways the Constitution provided for domestic tranquility by creating good relations between states. Much of the responsibility for providing for the common defense is vested in the president. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 explicitly states that Congress is in charge of providing for the general welfare of the states. And Article 5 makes sure that the blessings of liberty are secured as the country evolves. The ends of government seen in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution came from the thoughts of the framers. For the most part, they had similar views on what the ends of the Constitution were. Anti-Federalist writer Brutus argued that the common good is the end of civil government 
because government itself is created out of common interest. He also asserted that the Constitution needed a Bill of Rights in order to protect two other important ends of government, property and liberty. James Madison held beliefs similar to Brutus. He too thought that protection of property was one of the most important ends of government. But his definition of property included both objects and ideas. Therefore, protection of property extended to protection of free speech and other individual rights. Other disagreements regarding the ends of government often came down to which of them should be prioritized. Anti-Federalist anti -federalist framers like Robert Yates, Luther Martin, and George Mason stressed that the protection of individual rights was the end of government. Federalists emphasized a strong union, and smaller state delegates argued for equal representation. One end of government, protection, is still agreed upon. According to a 2015 survey by the Pew Research Center, 94% of people say protecting our country from terrorism is a top priority of government, and 88% say the same for natural disaster relief. Protection of individual rights also appears to be an important end of government today. The right to abortion, guns, and health care are all under heavy debate in the current political climate, as people remain adamant to not give up their liberties. Changes in the world have created new ends of government. Two concerns are climate change and COVID-19. People propagating these ideas argue that these problems must be addressed in order to protect the safety and happiness of society. On the other hand, some argue that the cost to undertake such actions might invade upon the protection of property and moderate taxation. Despite the debate, we must not stray too far from the fundamental principles of popular sovereignty. As Aristotle states in politics, society comes together insofar as they each attain the noble life. This is the end for all, both commonly and separately. More simply put, the ends of government are really the ends of society. Thank you, we are ready for your questions. Great, I'll start with the first question for you. So for the founders, one of the ends of a federal republic is avoiding the most common faction, that between the rich and the poor. How effective has the U.S. Constitution been in this regard? I would say the U.S. Constitution has been quite um, good in this regard, um, simply because of everybody being on equal footing in terms of voting rights and such. As we have evolved as a country, we have been able to incorporate more people into the um, vote, into voting and such through 19th Amendment, um, uh, in the 24th Amendment, I believe. Um, and as a result, everybody has kind of been able to um, kind of come together and get their own government. I would have to disagree with my colleague. Um, as we can see in the current crisis, um, around 5 million people um, applied for unemployment benefits last week. So I think it just shows that we don't really have a super <laughs> qualified structure in cases of emergencies. And I think if we kind of had planned um, better for it, then we could have limited the divisions between the poor and the wealthy. However, the federal government has made efforts to help the economic crisis we're now in with the Small Business Association giving small business owners money in order to keep their businesses alive. So let's talk a little bit about Aristotle. Um, and want to, I want to discuss Aristotle in the context of the progressive reforms of the last 75 years, most notably uh, initiative referendum and recall. Um, how would Aristotle have viewed these reforms? Would he have viewed them positively or negatively and why? I would say that he would have viewed them positively simply because as, as Aristotle states in politics, one of the primary ends of government is happiness of the people. And with uh, things like referendums, more people are able to have a say in government matters as a result can be more happy about the things that they can um, get into government. Aristotle also states in politics that a main purpose of a human being is to participate in government because this kind of provides for uh, fulfillment and virtue. So I think he would have also supported the um, initiative referendum system. However, Aristotle preferred a mixed government of a mixed government and pushing our government in towards referendums 
is more towards direct democracy, which Aristotle was against. Okay, I've got a question. I had a friend who's a police chief in a small town in South Carolina. His name's not Andy, but it could be. Um, that was a joke that might have passed everybody younger <laughs> than 50. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago, or actually last week, uh, he, the department got a phone call. Some, uh, somebody's reporting their neighbors who are having a barbecue with more than 10 people there. Based on the, you've given me reason to believe that he should have thrown them all in jail or that he should have laughed at all. Constitution seems to support, and what you said, Constitution seems to support either one of those approaches. What should he have done uh, with that report of an unlawful barbecue? Following the precedent of Jacobson v. Massachusetts with a uh, city requiring smallpox vaccines, uh, measures that protect the public health and safety are constitutional. Infringing on people's liberties is constitutional as long as they are a real and substantial benefit to public health. So the orders throughout states like Louisiana that would have prevented these gatherings of more than 10 people could be, um, are, it is properly constitutional to declare them illegal. And I would argue that he should have shut down the gathering. On the other hand, though, we as Americans tend to hold liberty quite dear to us in the preamble of the Constitution. One of the ends of government that uh, the founders set forth is to secure the blessings of liberty. And um, because of this, perhaps breaking up something like that would infringe upon people's liberty and freedom of movement and freedom to um, gather. So, so I might... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Tandy. No, go ahead, please. I'll just ask another question for you, um, which is, has the definition of good government changed over time? I would argue yes, it's changed over time. After, before the Great Depression, the government wasn't really involved in a welfare government where you provide for the people, instead the people were generally providing themselves. But as the New Deal policies that set up stuff like Social Security meant that the government was now getting involved in providing for individual people, that meant that now people view good government as a government that provides for the people and protects them from economic harm. I would say that the definition of good government has also extended to more people being able to vote and equality, which is outlined in the Declaration of Independence. However, since felons still don't have the constitutional ability to vote, I'm sure that the def like good government itself, there's still progress that can be made towards it. Has the separation of powers structure that the founders had in mind uh, in the Constitution, has that, uh, has that deteriorated or changed in such a way that we really don't have uh, such a structure anymore? And what, if anything, should we do about it? I think we still have a um, structured separation of powers, but sometimes um, one member of government, for example, President Trump has kind of um, tended to overstep his boundaries. For example, last week he said that he was the sole leader and he could tell states when to lift their um, stay-at-home stay orders, but he actually didn't have the authority. May I finish my thought? He didn't have the authority to do that. So when states push back on those challenges against separation of powers, I think our structure can stay intact. But if we stop pushing back, then it could definitely fall apart. Is okay. providing, I'm sorry. It's time. It's time, Tandy. Time. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'll go ahead and um, offer some feedback and then I will turn it over to my colleagues. Um, I thought you all did a nice job working through one of the things that I was very excited to hear was um, your mentioning of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. So often we're focused right on the preamble. And so to bring that out, I think was really important. Um, you also did a nice job working through the kind of uh, issues involved in the trade-offs between civil liberties and national security, um, civic virtue and natural rights. So I thought you did a nice job with that as well. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop there and maybe chime in again later if, if there's time. So I, um, 
the question that I asked you about uh, how Aristotle would view the um, progressive experiments with uh, more direct democracy, and I think you, uh, I mean, I think you can argue it both ways because because Aristotle does talk a little bit about participatory um, uh, democracy and and that that's a good thing, but he is clearly concerned about what I what he would characterize, I think, as an excess of democracy and. Um, you know, you you can argue that we needed these reforms. You can also argue that maybe they've gone too far. Uh, and uh, I think you correctly highlighted those issues and, and uh, I thought your answer was quite good. Um, you know, this business about uh, whether or not, um, you know, government has changed and so forth and the New Deal policies, um, I thought that was quite interesting. And I, it, what is the definition of good government? Um, and we look back to the 1800s and um, the periodic ec um, economic panics that we had, that our government wasn't involved in them at all to speak of. And uh, um, that's all changed. Is that good or bad? I'm not sure. So, I mean, obviously we needed to be more responsive. Um, and where does that take us? I don't know. But anyway, I thought the answers were good and it was, um, I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I also enjoyed the conversation very much. When I'm taking notes, on your presentation, I, I have for this one I have five blanks, uh, and to see if you've got because there, there are about, about five different questions that the uh, uh, that are called for to either answer. And so I'm looking, did you answer each one of those five ones, which you did uh, very well? Uh, but then when we in our discussion with you, when I'm trying to trying to get you to put those, I asked that really weird question about my my friend who's the police chief, and sometimes you got to take a stand. And you gave me really good evidence to say, okay, here's why I could have done this, but then here's why we're going it this way. And that was absolutely right. And it was absolutely great and a good answer. But the question was, what do you think? What should he have done? And sometimes I want you, it's just good to leap in there and said, you know, in these circumstances, he just, just should have done this. Um, as it was, he, um, I, I think the, the police decided they were very slow to respond. And so they made sure that uh, the barbecue was done before they got there. Because uh, uh, in situations like we are in today, there is no history to go on. We're, we're, in, we're in new waters here, but we're looking at very old documents and uh, problems that have happened again and again to help us resolve these. So what we're doing here matters a lot, and you're discussing these among yourselves like we did today. This is not just theoretical. What you've done today matters a lot, uh, and I'm glad we're able to have this conversation. So I look forward to hearing from you again when you graduate from law school or graduate school and move on to and, and take your place in the Senate and the House and on the uh, judicial bench. So look forward to us reading about you in years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.